We're in the middle of an interesting season for the last uh, about six months. A lot of interesting things have been taking place, and I've been talking to some folks and reading about the effects of the last six months, especially in light of the family, which as we jump into our family series today, you know, on one side of the uh, spectrum, there are divorces that are spiking across our nation. Many citing the close proximity to each other and uh, the stress of the, the situations that have caused this uh, incompatibility and this, uh, this, uh, this calling it quits on the marriage side. Others, it's been interesting, ha- have viewed, viewed the pandemic in a different way. Some have said, hey, you know, this has brought us together. The simplicity of life, the actual time that we get to spend together, uh, kind of refining of what's important, and that time that we usually don't have to spend together has been refreshing, has been good, and it's been a growing time for us. And so I, I just kind of shake my head, and, and, I, and I observe with you that the same exact heat, right? The same heat uh, is being applied, and for some, it's causing them to kind of implode, and, and they, they're just want one out, you know? Uh, and, and just the family is being torn apart. Others... They're, they're, the same heat is causing them to kind of come together and grow closer through the process. And it's one of those things, it's, it's an odd thing that the same exact situation across the board has is, is been very different in its results in the family. As we work into our family series here this morning, last week we talked about the family and, and we talked together about first things first. We, we talked together about David and his brothers and the challenges that they faced and the need to place God in first place of your family, to not get tied into and stuck in the rut of, of where we get all uh, messed up over secondary issues. And so first things first is a very important thing. Today, what I'd like to do with you is to consider the topic of our home as a refuge. There's a term, sometimes you think, how would you like to describe your home? For some, they, the, there's this word refuge. What I'd like to do is take the word refuge and look at it with you. And what we're going to do today is have a, a biblical theology exercise. Okay? What that means is there's a difference between systematic theology and biblical theology. Systematic theology takes all the different usages of maybe the word and all the scriptures and kind of puts it together and synthesizes it together. What biblical theology does is it traces it through the storyline of scripture and learns from it through that vantage point. So what we'll do is consider the home as a refuge, this idea of refuge, and we're going to trace it through the scriptures uh, from beginning to end and uh, consider uh, hoping to land back in our living rooms for application to our homes this idea of refuge. In the Old Testament, the word refuge is two predominant Hebrew words. The, the first is the word miklet, and it is this idea of a refuge, a safe retreat or a place of asylum. You get this place where you can go, this uh, place of safe retreat or asylum. The other word, a very similar meaning, uh, this maxe, is a place of refuge or protection. So there's, uh, there's two words that have almost the same meaning throughout the Old Testament. In the Greek, it's only used twice, the word refuge, and it's from the, the verb katafugo, uh, which is to flee for help or to run to safety, to run to refuge, okay? So those are the ideas through the Old and New Testament. This idea of refuge, uh, also I want to make sure and, and note that is this. Refuge is often tied to a word picture. David was amazing at this, but uh, throughout the Old Testament, the word refuge is often tied to a word picture. Let me give you a few of them. Some of the predominant word pictures tied to refuge are a fortress, or a rock, or shade from the burning sun. The other word pictures are a sheltering wing, a shield, or a strong tower. If you notice some of the words, we sang some of those word pictures in our songs this morning about God is a rock. There's a sheltering wing. We, we, We use some of those words, a shield. We use some of those words in our songs this morning. Pictures of, of what a refuge is in real time. 
Now, as we look into it, and we're going to start from creation, go all the way to consummation, the end of it all, but uh, let me give you two key factors. That in my study of the word refuge, two key aspects of refuge that I hope you'll keep in mind as we walk from beginning to end of the Scriptures. The first pro- predominant idea about a refuge is it is th- this aspect of protection. So there's two ideas, protection and provision. The first is the aspect of protection. Refuge typically has this idea of, I have protection from something. Okay? Uh, let me give you a biblical example. Psalm 51.1 says this. Psalm 51.1 says, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings... I will t- make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. You see in this pa- passage, actually, we have a word picture with refuge, right? The shelter of a wing. This idea of refuge is it's somewhere where I can have protection until all these calamities that are surrounding me will pass by. Okay? So it's a place of protection. You know, there's a, a lot of, uh, you know, think about kids' games, there's a lot of different versions of chase games. One of the more popular chase games is a game called Capture the Flag. In a game called Capture the Flag, you have two teams. Both teams have a flag, and they hide it on their respective sides. Uh, And then in the middle of the field, there's usually a bunch of cones or something that divides the two sides, okay? And if you are on your side, you are in a place of safety, if you will, right? When you cross that line, what happens? You can be tagged or hit by a ball. You're trying to find their flag, but you're in the, the enemy zone. And you're not in a place of safety, so you have to run and dodge things. And, 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 if, and if somebody's about to tag you, you try to get back across the line, and then you're, you can rest, right? You don't have to run anymore. Now, you might have to run and tag somebody who's trying to get to your flag. But the point is, you're back in the area of safety. You don't need to run any longer, You know, life involves a lot of running. Our life involves a lot of running, a lot of lack of rest, a lot of lack of safety, a lot of lack of security. And refuge is the place where you don't have to run anymore. That's that aspect of refuge. Uh, You may have to run to get there, but once you get to that refuge, I'm in a place of protection. That's this idea of protection. The second aspect of the idea of refuge is it's a place of provision. Not only is it protection from something, but it's a provision for you in that time. Here's a a, a biblical example in Ruth chapter 2, verse 12. In Ruth 2, verse 12, it says, The Lord repay your work and and full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings... You have come for refuge. Here in Ruth chapter 2, there's this, kind of the context real quickly here, is Ruth, who has left her home, her homeland. She's traveled with her mother-in-law back to Israel, and it's there that she's working hard to help provide for her mother-in-law and herself, uh, two widows. And she's there trying to work for supporting her and her mother-in-law. And it's there where God, in the situation, brings a man named Boaz. Boaz is this rich landowner who is providing for her and giving her help. And in the midst of that, he encourages her here in Ruth chapter 2. He encourages her, hey, you've left your homeland. You've left that, that certainly some protection aspects there. But you, you long for this aspect of an identity and a provision and a new people and a new identity. And, and he prays this blessing upon her. The Lord repay your work and full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel. This idea of encouragement, of, of strength that, that you're going to receive, that, that God's going to bless you in a refuge situation. Not only protect you, but provide strength and encouragement for you during that time. So it's not just protection from an enemy, but, but and usually through a person, usually God, this presence of one who's going to provide for you in the midst of your need for protection, to give you peace, to give you strength in that place of refuge. So two aspects, protection from and provision for, is what refuge tends to you know, show through the Bible. Now let's do it, okay? Let's walk into the Bible. We're going to start with 
creation. So again, we're going to weave our way through the scriptures and hopefully land back in your living room as we seek to apply these truths. First, it starts in creation. The aspect of a refuge begins for us and it's pictured for us in the aspect of a garden. God prepared a place for the first family. God made this place where they could have uh, this home of their own, this, 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 this uh, place of provision and, and, and this refuge that God provides. And he does so, and then he brings mankind into it and places them in the garden. It was a place of fellowship, not only enjoying each other, but the very presence of God. They walked and talked with God. His very presence was this amazing provision for, for them, encouragement, strength for their relationship. It was not a place devoid of work. Sometimes we think of refuge as like my place of laziness and self-indulgence. That was not the situation in the Garden of Eden. They had work, but it was rewarding and fulfilling and meaningful. Wonderful picture of this garden-like refuge. But the picture doesn't last, does it, in Genesis 1 and 2. In fact, we move next to the consequences from sin that enter the picture. You see, what's interesting in this aspect of creation now to complications from sin is when you look at creation in Genesis 1 and 2, you don't actually see the word refuge. And in fact, you probably shouldn't see the word refuge because there's nothing they need protection from, right? They're in a perfect place. They don't need any protection. There's certainly the aspect of provision in the garden. But now we move into Genesis 3, and now there's this need for protection. There's, there's this need where they're now pushed out of the garden and now they're on the run. They have no place of home, of refuge. Sin changed all that. Man and woman sought to elevate themselves as kings. They didn't want to listen to the rightful king. They wanted to define good and, good and evil for, on their own. And it had disastrous results. Here's one of the devastating effects that comes out. You'll see it here on the screen in Genesis 3, verse 8. Instead of enjoying God's presence, Adam and Eve have sinned, and now what do they do in this text? In this text, they they run and hide themselves from the very presence of one who has been their, their provision, their sustainer. There are the fellowship they enjoy in him. Sin has changed it. There's complications. I'm running and hiding instead of coming to and enjoying the presence of God. They're forced out of the place of refuge, and now they're on the run. This sad picture because of sin that comes into our world. That sad picture that we feel on a regular basis of being on the run, of not having rest and security and peace. No refuge. I want to fast forward to you, invite you to turn your Bibles to Joshua 20. Here's where this idea of refuge really begins to take shape in the scriptures. In Joshua chapter 20, what we see next are cities of refuge. Okay, here's where God is calling out his nation out of of Egypt, the nation of Israel. He's bringing them into the promised land, and God has a plan. He's preparing beforehand to have them go into the promised land, and when they go in, to have the plan of God in place for for what he wants his, his land to be. God has explained the concept of cities of refuge earlier than Joshua 20. You can go back to number 35. You can look look in Deuteronomy 19. Both of those places describe the cities of refuge, but it's in Joshua 20 when they're in the land, they're dividing up the land, they're organizing it, and God just reminds them once again of what he's already explained here in this text. So, So let's look at it when they're ready to inhabit the land, when they're dividing up the land. Here's Joshua 20. I want to read a few verses here. It says in verse 1, The Lord also spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint for yourselves cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses. He's referring back to now Numbers 35, Deuteronomy 19, as I just mentioned. He says here, verse 3, That the slayer who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. 
And when he flees to one of those cities and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city as one of them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. That if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor unintentionally, but did not hate him beforehand. And he shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment and until the death of the one who is high priest in those days. Then the slayer may return and come to his own city and his own house to the city from which he fled. And now the next few verses here, they give the name of those six cities. There were three on the, the uh, east side of the Jordan River and there were three on the west side of the Jordan River that he names here. Now skip down to verse 9. It says, These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel and for the stranger who dwelt among them that whoever killed a person accidentally might flee there and not die in the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. What I want to do is take a few minutes to kind of look into Joshua 20 here and, and draw out aspects of this idea of refuge. Now, we already gave you the context of, hey, let's, let's talk through refuge in the area of protection on one side and provision on the other. Let's first look in this section about what this aspect of protection is in these designated cities. What's cool here is, and one more thing about the cities is, there's one in the north, one in the central, and one in the south, both on either side of the Jordan River, okay? So something that's accessible, okay? When you look at these cities, uh, they, were, they were, first of all, this area's protection is, they were that. They were designated and accessible cities. They were ones that you could make it to. They weren't just like, hey, the people in the south, they're close, you know, they can just step over the line and they're, they're good to go. It was accessible to, to everybody. They were designed, God had thought it through, and he had given them specific cities by which to designate as these areas of protection. Now, one of the key things we think about protection is, is secondly, this aspect of safety. In this passage, there's someone called the Avenger of Blood. It's kind of a scary title. Okay, in this passage. Now, what was the avenger of blood? Who was the avenger of blood? Typically, the avenger of blood was the closest male relative to the one who had died. Okay, so someone dies, his, the closest male relative is designated as the avenger of blood. And in their honor culture, the honor, honorable thing was to do was that avenger of blood was to go and take the life of the one that, that killed their relative. It was life for life. It was, it was not so much about vengeance as it was this, the, the sanctity of life and the honor by which you killed someone made in the image of God. It wasn't the role of the avenger of blood to really look into intentional versus unintentional. Not, was he a murderer or a manslayer? It wasn't really about that for the avenger of blood. It was, you have killed a relative of mine. I'm the one that's, that's to honor his death by, by killing you, okay? So it's one of those like, oh, this is kind of interesting here. What's going on here in restoring of honor? But it, again, it wasn't his area of, it was retribution. It wasn't, it wasn't about discerning right from wrong, murder versus manslaughter, okay? Those cities of refuge were that place of safety, Okay? The cities of refuge took on the role of trying to figure out discernment concerning this issue. And you see here in this, this, uh, this, these locations, a person that, that, that someone died from them. You look at numbers, one of the illustrations is you threw a rock and you, you didn't see somebody and you hit somebody and they died. You're like, oh, like I, it wasn't intentional, but somebody died. You know, there's various ways by which someone could die on accident from your hands, and you were to run to these, these locations for protection. And, and as long as the individual remained with them, verse 4 here says, as long as you remain in the city, you were protected from the avenger of blood who was coming to honor the death of his relative. This aspect of protection. Revenge and violence were not allowed from the hand of the avenger in the cities of refuge. And one more thing I want to say about the aspect of protection here is that is there was unilateral protection, which is kind of really cool in this passage. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, who was protected? Was it just, you know, citizens in good standing? 
No, it was everybody, right? It was even the, the foreigner, the stranger in the land. They go to the city of refuge. They're seeking asylum there and protection, refuge, and you are to honor them in the city of refuge here. So even non-Israelites, it was for everybody. God cares for all people. His heart is a heart of justice. Okay, so that's what, what the happens here uh, in the cities of refuge. And one of those cool things that, that our, our justice system, even today, takes from passages like this is this aspect of innocent until proven guilty, right? You get to be heard. Now, that takes us into the second aspect of things, not only the protection, but the provision side. So let's talk about the provision side in Joshua chapter 20. One of the first aspects of provision is this aspect of righteous judgment. You know, it's, it's something that can be taken for granted of, and I think we're starting to, in our culture today, not take for granted that you can be heard. You know, not just someone thinks you did wrong and they come in as the avenger of blood and takes your life because they interpret it this way. It's something that, that we should not take for granted that you get to be heard, that you have a chance to give your side, a chance to be heard. It is not an s- insignificant thing. Uh, last week, one of, the, one of the things we mentioned from 1 Samuel 17 with David and his brothers was this, this aspect of assumptions we make sometimes in family. This aspect of, of assumptions. I just, I just know what's in your heart, they said, David. You're just here to, to gawk at the battle. I, I know you. And assumptions kill good communication. One of the cool things about this passage is you have a chance to be heard. Righteous judgment. Chance to hear, give your case. Verse 4, the individual who runs the city of refuge would go before the elders at the gate. Now, in ancient cities, most of them had some measure of a a gated system to it. And in the the, the main gate often would sit the the wise elders of the city. You see that in, in, in Boaz and Ruth. You remember in the book of Ruth, to settle the matter of who Ruth gets to marry, Boaz has to go before the elders at the gate. So here is this aspect in Joshua 20. The elders at the gate, is, is they, he goes and makes, he or she goes and makes their case known before the elders at the gate. They would hear his case. And what's an important note here is, we, we got to make sure we communicate this, that it wasn't just a good old boy system in these cities of refuge. Hey, just go there. You can do whatever you want, murder whoever you want. And you just run to the city of refuge and you're like, hey, I'm good. You know what? I, there, protect me. Because the reality is they will hear your case, but if, if you're found to be guilty, they hand you over to the avenger of blood. It wasn't just like, hey, as long as you make it to the city, you're good. It's, you get to be heard. You get to have righteous judgment given on your account from an impartial elder or assembly there in the city. So there's this aspect of first provision is the area of, of righteous judgment. The second area is this aspect of shelter. Look at the end of verse 4. At the end of verse 4, if, if, as you hear the initial case there, and it's something that, that you want to listen to and you want to you explore, you are to provide them shelter. The city of refuge had to have places to stay for these individuals on the run. Place of shelter provided for you. The, the last thing here is this aspect of you have this, this sanctuary situation. It's an interesting caveat in verse 6 of Joshua 20. These protections and provisions for the individual would last uh, in one of two aspects. The first aspect in verse 6 is the case is heard by the assembly and the results are given. Okay, So this aspect of we've heard your case, we've, we've made a judgment. The second aspect of, of this uh, sanctuary uh, ending is in the second aspect is the death of the high priest. Now, I was reading a lot lot about this one. There's different opinions on this. The idea is here that the high priest would provide, in in his life in a sense, would provide this umbrella of protection for you. And then when he died, the idea typically was, if I understand it correctly, that it was like his his death was like this atonement, and there would be this reset, and you could go home. But this this aspect of the, the high priest and his life providing this umbrella of protection. So as long as the high priest is there, you can stay in the city of refuge and have safety and sanctuary. So here's these two aspects in the cities of refuge. Protection and provision being provided for here. 
there is a whole other area that I didn't have time to really go into, and that's the, the cave experiences of David. He uses the term refuge repeatedly, and he's the one that often associates these, these caves or rocks, strong towers, shields, wings to refuge. David really puts it on poetically in the book of Psalms and in his use of the term refuge through his cave experiences. What I'd like to do with you, though, is to fast forward to the person of Christ. Fast forward to Christ with me. If you turn the pages to the New Testament in your Bibles and you begin the story of Jesus, right away you meet Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph are living in a time frame of Roman rule. In Roman rule in their day, Caesar Augustus has declared that everybody has to go to their place of origin, their family origin, to, he wants to tax it, right? You know, the thing that, that they continues to this day, taxation. You know, he's, he's, he wants to count you and tax you. And so Mary and Joseph, from page one of the New Testament, are they in the place of home, in a place of refuge? They're not, right? They're, they're on the move. They're going to a place where they, they don't live. They travel from w- up in the north of Israel down to Bethlehem. When they get to Bethlehem, do they find refuge? No, the scripture says there was no room for them in the inn, right? When you look at the story of Jesus, now as Jesus grows in his public ministry, Jesus grows in his public ministry and he begins as a man to proclaim the kingdom of Jesus Christ. He's asked once about his life and his ministry, and he uses this phrase in Matthew 8.20. He says, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In Jesus' public ministry, did he experience refuge? Rest, home, shelter, protection, and provision. No, right? Again, he displays for us this wandering life. I don't have refuge. But, but Jesus lived a perfectly righteous life, right? But instead of receiving his reward, his true refuge, because of his righteousness, he, he doesn't receive that either, does he? The scriptures tell us he was taken outside the city. He was exposed to the darkness on a cross. And he was buried in a borrowed tomb. No picture of refuge, home, protection, and provision in the life and death of Jesus Christ. But here's some encouraging news I want to give you from the person of Jesus that ties into this word refuge. Hebrews 6, verses 18 and 20 say this. Hebrews 6, 18 and 20 say that by two immutable things, unchanging things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge. This is one of the two instances of the word in the New Testament. We fled to refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is one of those interesting, you know, interesting character. Melchizedek in the Old Testament, interesting reference to Jesus as the high priest. And one thing that we would be tempted to do if we weren't tracing this aspect of refuge through the whole scriptures, it, we'd be very tempted to skip over the fact that Jesus is the high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Do you remember back to the aspect of Joshua 20 with me for just a moment ago when we were looking at it? The aspect of you had this umbrella of protection for you in the city of refuge as long as who was alive. As long as the high priest was alive, you had that umbrella of protection in your life, right? But when he died, things changed. When you look at Jesus Christ, your great high priest, this tells you, in this passage, it's talking about this this longing of our hearts for refuge, this longing of our hearts, and it describes it as a hope that is steadfast and sure. You will not lose this refuge if you run to refuge to Jesus. You won't lose it. Why? Because he is a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He will live 
forever. He is forever a high priest. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose from the dead as your great high priest who will live forever. He alone can provide eternal, eternal refuge for your soul that our soul so longs for. If you're here today and, and, and you, you don't have Jesus as your refuge, man, I invite you today. Jesus loves you. Jesus has provided refuge for you. And he will live forever to keep that refuge to your soul. It's a beautiful picture as we look at this idea of refuge. We come to Jesus Christ. Now look, let's look at the consummation of all things, the end. You see, we long for eternity. We long for it in various ways, but we long to taste it now. I want heaven, but I want to taste it here. Taste an aspect of it. Revelation 21 describes it this way. Revelation 21 tells us about that aspect of what heaven will be like and why we long for it so desperately. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. This beautiful picture of when we get there, it will truly be a place that God has prepared beforehand, a place he invites us to be there and enjoy a place of refuge, a place of harmony, a place of tears and death, no longer full and final refuge in the presence of God. Again, that person that provides the refuge. So, so creation, all the way to consummation, this concept of refuge. Let's look for a couple moments here at our living rooms as we try to apply this aspect of refuge to our homes. The first thing I want to say to you is this, our home will never be heaven. Our home will never be heaven. I mentioned to you just, just in this last aspect of consummation, we long for heaven. We do, our hearts long for the taste of heaven, and we want to taste it here. But the reality is we're pilgrims and we're not there yet. We're on a journey, but we're not there with that said, I, I want to be clear, there's aspects in our homes where we have unrealistic expectations of perfectionism we demand, and it's not right. You know, one of the things that, that, uh, that I have to often apologize to in my own home is I can walk in and I can see what's not right. I, and it's like I walk in, I see it. Hey, this, that. And my kids would nod their heads very quickly and, and I have to apologize for that because I walk in and I see, I want this to be this. And I walk in, and instead of it being appreciative or ben, uh, seeing the positive, I'm like, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And, and it's like, that's, that's not helpful. This, this unrealistic perfectionism of the home. We have to put on a different lens. We're not home yet. Our homes, we want them to be a taste of heaven, but they're not heaven. So let's be clear. Let's distinguish the two, and let's be thankful, and, and let's be positive when we walk into our homes. Start with thankfulness, it, and it's right for us to lead the way toward heaven in our homes. The, heaven is glorious. Why? Because Jesus is there. When we look at our homes, we want to invite the presence of God in our homes, right? So, so we want to we resemble the place that we want to take ultimate refuge we want the, the word of God and prayer to be welcome in our homes, leading the way towards that final destiny, but we're not there yet. Let me give two more things to you. The one, two aspects that we've talked about refuge is this. We've talked about protection, and we've talked about provision. The first thing I want to say here is I want to encourage you as a family 
to communicate what protection looks like from your perspective. Okay? What does protection look like from your perspective? I want to encourage you to designate and define your home as a place of protection. Designate it and define it. Now, some of you will say, hey, you know, it's just understood. This is a place where you can just be safe. It's, you're protected here. Can, can I encourage you to designate it? This home is a place where violence is not welcome. This home is a place where, where judge, for false judgment, again, there's righteous judgment in the cities of refuge, but judgmentalism is not welcome. That false judgment. We want truth with grace, yes, but judgmentalism is not welcome here. Designate that in your homes. And, and let me also say this. You may need to get into some of the details to define what that looks like. You know, there's aspects of Chris and I in our home, when we think about this aspect of just protecting each other and what protection looks like and peace of mind and all those sort of things, uh, one of the things for us we've had to have conversations about is when it's time to go to sleep and, and perhaps there's a day or there's, some, there's definitely some days where we haven't had a chance to really debrief and communicate in the evening together. Our kids are staying up way too late with us these days, but that's a side thing. You know, when we go to bed, sometimes, you know, there's been times where my wife just like wants to talk and then she talks and I'm like, and then she's like, oh, good, I got that off my chest and she falls right asleep and now my brain's turned on. And I'm up for like an hour or two. And I've had to say, hey, honey, I love you and I want to communicate, but right as I'm trying to drift off to bed is not the best time for me. When I think about you, like just being protected from like my brain getting turned on and now all the aspects of things to worry about for tomorrow and things about anxiety and this, things, just things to process, they're not helpful for me right at bed. So we've had to define for us some of that, like, what does the definition of it look like? What does protection look like for you? W what do you grow anxious or worried or stressed about? What do you need protection from? Communicating that with each other. De designating and defining it. Work through it together. Communicate over this aspect of protection and what refuge in your home means. The, the, third, the last aspect here, this area of provision. Provision. The provision side of refuge, as I already mentioned, is often tied to a person. Cities of refuge, the high priest, leading us to Christ, our great high priest. God has provided us refuge in the gospel. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are not just treated fairly. You are treated with mercy and grace in the gospel. And so what we're called to do in this area of provision in our homes is not just go, hey, God's done this for me, and I'm just going to receive it all and then just sit back in my place of refuge. No, the aspect of provision inside of refuge is, this is what I've received from God, and therefore I want to help to keep that going to others in my home, to provide, to push that out. What I know of God and what I've experienced from Him, I want to reflect that forward in my life. In every area, yes, in the area of business, yes, in the area of politics, yes, in the area of my home, I want what God has done in me to, to, to so keep going forward to others. To, to not, refuge is not an idea of I just, I, I just go hide out and I never talk in the public realm. I never talk in politics. I never talk in the area of my home. I just, it's all for me. No, it's a refuge that I have been provided for and I want to provide for others. And so as you seek refuge in your homes, can I ask you this? Can you not just, just go home and you're like, I can think of all the things that I'm ready to share, how you can help me be uh, in a good place of refuge in my home. Well, would I ask, can I ask you when you go home that you'll ask first, how can I help you to this place be a refuge to you? Each of us have different personalities, strengths, and weaknesses, and we process this stuff differently. How can I help you to, to find refuge at home? For some, it's like they might want people over more often. For others, they're like, no, I don't want people all over my home all the time. You know, there's, there's different ways we process things, right? So how can I help you to be, provide refuge? God has done this to me. I'm, I'm refreshing him. How can I refresh you? And certainly, yes, we want to ask it of each other. 
But the first conversation I invite you to have is asking others in your family, how can I help you to find refuge? In our families, we open with this, right? There's plenty of heat. There's plenty of heat around us that would seek to consume our homes. I, I want to I just remind us today, God is a refuge, and he provides refuge. And I just want to close in prayer asking God to bless your homes, that it is a safe retreat, a place of refuge where you are protected and you can, you can be vulnerable, you can share, you can, you can experience life together in that safe, protected environment. And it's a place of provision where God is blessed and that, that you are willing to be that provision to others in your home, strengthening their souls for the heat that's all around us. Let me pray as we close to, together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this tracing through this aspect of the word refuge. Lord, I, I, I confess that, uh, Lord, uh, there's, there's oftentimes in our own homes where we are part of the cause of the lack of refuge. And so I pray that even today there might be the, the need to ask for forgiveness and get things right with each other. I pray you'd open up doors of communication through your word today that, that we will, perhaps with fresh eyes or at least fresh eyes from uh, this we haven't looked at in a long time, to consider each other and consider what this aspect of refuge wants to do in our very families. And so, God, would you take your word, would you apply it to our lives? Would you, would you cause us to do right, even if someone else around us does wrong? Would you, would you guide us towards you and walk that path to where you ultimately will, are going to? You promise and you cannot lie. There's a hope, steadfast and secure, that refuge is coming. Thank you for Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.